Sean Cahill is one of the witnesses to the famous USS Nimitz Tic Tac UFO. He's a retired US Navy Chief Petty Officer and has had numerous breathtaking encounters with the phenomenon. This is my second conversation with Sean. This time we discuss recent UAP events, what the next year may hold, and his own experiences. If you haven't got two hours, please see the description for timestamps. Thanks for doing this with me again, Sean. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, since we spoke last, obviously lots has happened and lots has changed or potentially changed. What were your thoughts on the recent UAP hearing? I think like a lot of people that watched, I was a little confused. Um, yeah. It's it's hard to really judge uh, on the one side if, if you want to give benefit of the doubt uh, to Mr. Kirkpatrick. It's that there's a learning curve here. And that it's a very it's a very steep one, and we have to start somewhere, and that's at the bottom. On the other hand, I think a lot of us are are really curious as to why we were briefed unknowns, um, why we were shown videos of of prosaic things that could be easily explained when the office we're looking towards is supposed to be investigating unknowns and unexplained phenomena. Um, we're far more interested in that, but but let's cut straight to the chase. This isn't about balloons and about filters being removed at NORAD over the last six months to a year. And it's not about what we've seen very recently. It's about a 75 year investigation with countless programs, billions of dollars invested, spread across the, the military industrial complex and, and numerous aerospace companies and a, a cadre of secrets that has yet to have been exposed to the American people and the world at large. So yeah. when we see a hearing like this, um, I want to be positive, but in a lot of way, it feels like bread and circuses. Um, and it feels like a smoke show. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What's your take on, on that? You said like, why are they, why is he talking about, you know, the stuff that we know and, and things like that? Why is the smoke show? Is it, is it that there are people, you know, above him or behind the scenes, pulling the strings and saying, let's obfuscate this, let's make this way more confusing and you know unnecessarily elongated you know, or is it just a case of he's trying to do things you know what he believes to be by the book and he's trying to like do you have confidence in him and in the organization or what are you i do you i do have confidence that that sean kirkpatrick is going to operate properly within the bounds of protocol um i don't feel like he's trying to pull one over on anybody um i certainly don't feel like senator gillibrand and others are trying to do that I fear that what we're dealing with here is the direct gulf between classified information and unclassified information, how to get classified information declassified and sanitized so it can be shared with the public at large. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people would say that can occur at the executive level uh, with, with very little red tape, and I would agree with that. Um, but I don't see the current presidency or executive branch having any real interest in this. This seems to be more of a legislative um, long-term leadership problem. Again, we're brought back to that idea. So we just had arrow came out and made sure to tell us uh, no evidence of extraterrestrials. Well, nobody asked for evidence of extraterrestrials. We wanted you to tell us what's going on and what's mm -hmm. been going on for 75 yeah. years. So cool. You still have no evidence of extraterrestrials what would you say we have evidence of why have we continued to study this program ad nauseum for 75 years why is so much wrapped up in this for us to get here and talk about balloons yeah. and to talk about prosaic things it doesn't make sense so we need someone who's going to actually step up to the mic at some point and actually ask the, the right questions to the right people and not take the i don't knows for an answer but again how does someone who has signed non-disclosure agreements received briefings within a skiff and is constrained by law concerning things like treason how are they going to share that information what protections exist for these people um to to have a conversation that it doesn't seem like leadership really wants to have yeah yeah, it's such a frustrating issue, isn't it? It's so frustrating. The way it's all been handled is... Do you have hope? You do have hope. You said then you have hope and you have, you believe in Sean to an extent. Do you have hope that, yeah, 
this whole thing is gonna and by this whole thing obviously i don't mean the whole thing i mean yeah. arrow really the, the the all domain anomaly resolution office are they gonna sort it out sort their sort themselves out a little bit here and is it going to be a little bit more respectable at least next time even if we don't get any form of disclosure is it going to at least be non-embarrassing and then non-frustrating at some point soon well i wish i could guarantee that um yeah. i'd like to hope that uh i, I like to hope that the folks at arrow uh dr kirkpatrick and, and anyone else on his limited support staff is listening to what people have to say um i hope they're tapping into the right folks to ask the right questions um i will tell you my hope doesn't come from arrow um and and my hope doesn't come from the legislative process it comes from the rumblings that i hear from the beltway about whistleblower protections about mm -hmm. immunity about closed door test uh testimony um of witnesses um specifically military and government folks but of verifiable incidents um that have frankly shaken that as they are being revealed and discussed are shaking leadership up we're not seeing evidence of that on the public face we're seeing a stoic business as usual um you know in between the gavel kind of conversation mm. um i am hopeful but like a lot of people i feel like i've had the carpet yanked out from under me a couple of times in the last few years because the I don't want to say the opposition because I couldn't really point at an opposition, um, not a, a totally organized and obvious monster, uh, you know, on the hill, so to speak. But there is there is some cadre of official folks that just doesn't even want to have the conversation. This the stigma still exists, and but now the stigma is is has kind of been weaponized, where it's just it's just a default mode for a lot of people um and so it's we need to get more of the folks that have been involved in this over the years in front of those microphones not people that just got introduced to the subject within the last six months and are still in the kindergarten and and, and early phase of their learning process yeah. um so i look forward to a day where 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 we start hearing from experts instead of the with no offense to mr kirkpatrick but the the bureaucratic middlemen that have been placed in between the answers and the public yeah I know you're probably going to have to be careful how you answer this one, but do you think there's any chance that we're going to see Lou at some point stand up in one of these or, or be invited to one of these to to answer some questions or anything like that, to, to share what he knows in an official? I do. I think that you're going to see Lou stand up in any capacity that he's able to um, and use his voice in, in whatever way that he can. He's an incredibly important voice. Uh, I'm sure that if if those protections are offered um, he would take advantage of that and and do his due diligence for the American people and the world at large. Um, we both believe. They... Please, sorry, no, no, mine was boring. Are you go? I was just going to say we both believe very much in um, the ethics of this situation. Demand that folks who have information that can help solve this problem come forward and discuss it. He and I are, are we strongly agree. Um, on that level of dedication so i i do believe if offered the opportunity to speak mm -hmm. the truth uh luis elizondo would most definitely step up to the mic yeah but what would have to happen for that to to take place he would have to be invited would he by kirkpatrick or by arrow or like who would be sean would it that would sure i well one would assume or it could be a, it could be anyone in leadership that has the the power to compel an american citizen to testify mm -hmm. Do you uh, do you think they want him to testify? The question is who's the they we're speaking of. <laughs> yeah. People yeah. who want to get to the bottom of this, most certainly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People who want to continue to uh to apply the fog of war to this and 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 confuse people and um provide instability of information. No, they don't want him to testify. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the problem, I guess, because we know Robert Salas. He he sent all of his stuff to them, right? And he's happy to do it as well. And obviously, we didn't hear a peep about that. We didn't hear a peep about um, because that came up in the first hearing, right? Or not the first, but the the first recent, the first modern day hearing. Mm -hmm. And also, what came up there wasn't it the the Davis, the Wilson Davis notes, um, the mm -hmm. memo, the memo, and that didn't get followed up at all. Um, it was all just yeah. 
it's mm. um it's not good police work yeah we're seeing let me put it that way it's not good gumshoe detective work on anybody's part and people are going right around what are frankly the most interesting and anomalous issues in regards to this anomalous phenomenon um we could we could probably seg into if we wanted to you know the the conscious blocks a lot of people seem to put up around the phenomenon but in general here it it's it's just confusing it really does seem like uh as i keep saying a smoke show i don't understand why we we continue to have people coming out from behind closed doors talking about sobering information yeah. talking about having been shaken to their core that leadership is opening their eyes to a new paradigm and unfortunately when given the opportunity to speak to the public which is is frankly let's be real this is a niche audience that's paying attention it's defense officials intelligence officials and people interested in ufos and that's probably about it and to come out and just dance around this this in this way and and kind of what I give what I felt was kind of like a, a, a lackluster last minute PowerPoint presentation um, that didn't address the uh, the level of educate yourself that I believe the Senator Gillibrand had um, had had placed on 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 this issue, an expectation that you should come to the table educated, that you should have done your due diligence and that we don't need to see another airplane bird or or sun dog. Um, but we do want to know what was hovering over our nuclear assets. And we do want to know what was coming in from orbit down over the USS Nimitz and the Princeton. We do want to know what Lieutenant Graves encountered off the East Coast in his F-18, et cetera. Yeah. Um, they need to hear that message. So yeah. um, I, I guess I'm, the two, I guess the two positive takeaways were one that it actually happened and two that your basketball had a, has a new video uh, featuring you know it, what did you make of that video it looks just like what i've seen it looks just like what other people have seen um yeah i've seen a lot of personal videos from folks um it looked like what we call a silver basketball it was um yeah. it doesn't fit any of the uh prosaic uh slots that other folks want to put it into for me because I have seen one with my with the naked eye against a blue sky here near my home. So we could speculate all day. I mean, point defense, intel gathering, drones for, for a larger platform. Um, you know, I think we all assume kind of the same stuff. But uh, these are seen a lot. It's I had an interesting conversation with someone the other day that I said I want I look forward to the day when the when the kind of known like everybody knows these silver basketball things or as i call them are out there too many people have photographed them seen them um enough people have been able to corroborate that they're often seen around power lines and power stations and things like that we could speculate all day whether they're material energy terrestrial extraterrestrial all these other things people want to jump to extra dimensional and all this other stuff let's start with they're they're definitely around they're mm. flying there. We see them. They're moving yeah. through the air. I should say they're moving through the air. Cause I always say that flying is a characteristic of a, of a plane. Mm. Um, but it, it was very, it's compelling to, it, it, or excuse me, it's very compelling to see them talking about them though. Yeah. Because yeah. now we're getting into shapes and the shapes do seem to repeat. We're not looking at cobbled together ships like the enterprise with, you know, nacelles and, the, and these other things. We're looking at at Plutonian shapes, you know, squares, triangles, circles, lenticular. Um, well, lenticular shape isn't Plutonian per se, but um, I'm far more interested in, in, in those things because that now we're showing the, the commonality across the board. You know, let's yeah. talk about black triangles. Let's it would be nice if Mr. Kirkpatrick did expose the current um, delta shape programs that the United States has that are unclass and then was able to to give a sanitized kind of briefing to the public that, of course, we have advanced platforms that utilize the same delta wing configuration, but they don't fit 
the five observable pattern of anti-gravity or hypersonic craft that are reported by witnesses. I would love to see an educated person in front of that microphone that has corroborated historical data with current data and knowns to give us an understanding of what's going on. If there is an anomalous unknown operating technology here, say it. If we don't know where it's from because we're stuck here and we only have our observational data or alleged contact data to to go off of it's it's about time we got to the bottom of this we're all speculating these are aliens yeah. so what's the big secret the cynic in me wonders whether they just kind of put that video up and it, it's so that in the next hearing they can be like oh we figured it out it was just a balloon or whatever you know it's an easily explainable one that they plant in but then the kind of more hopeful side is that it's still potentially unresolved at the next hearing and they might have to kind of start answering the hard question as to why is it unresolved and how long is it going to be unresolved for and everything like that. And and obviously, like you said, these things are being seen far more frequently and regularly by lots of people. And yeah, we want to know, really. There was a paper a few years back. If I recall the, the title of it, it was Estimating the Flight Characteristics um was how it began but it, it was concerning the tic tac mm -hmm. and it was it was unclass or declassified or unclass to begin with i can't remember who wrote it um but it was fantastic and when we think about the t i'm not i don't bring up the tic tac just because i was there my involvement i think is actually other than the fact that i remember what happened and i'm able to you know to repeat it is actually rather uninteresting however that event is the most one of the most well documented UAP sightings that's ever occurred, yeah. and the amount of sensor data that was taken in that's still classified is 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 should be rather high based on the platforms that were there gathering um, information, and so we are looking. That is a case that we could immediately go back to and pull archival satellite data, um, data from any other platforms in the area, from the other submarines, from the Nimitz all of the sensor data from the USS Princeton, from the classified systems that were up in the shipboard uh, signals exploitation space, where you know the regular folks aren't allowed to go. We don't even know what equipment's in that room. Um, those sensor suites and those stacks, their information's still classified. There's no reason for Arrow not to just focus completely for three months on, on Tic Tac. Yeah. Yeah. and come up with an explanation for the american people as to what we're looking at mm -hmm. because we we the five observables practically sprung out of that encounter because they were all present and the eyewitness testimony that came later from folks like me and others only corroborated what had already been studied and what had already been been coined then as the five observables and we had no idea that the, that that nomenclature existed yeah so I would love I to agree more. Yeah, I would love to see them focus on a deliverable like that instead of this, yeah. this wavy piecemeal. Nothing. Still haven't mm -hmm. found the aliens yet. Yeah, we're Still looking at the last come, twenty years, and we have six hundred odd, you know, cases, and but we have no idea. And but but it's probably nothing. It's, it's mostly nothing, and all that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, that would be great. If only let's try and get that message to them. You pass pass that on to some people, and and say pass it on, and yeah, just focus on the Nimitz for for three months, and yeah. yeah tell us what you got and if you got nothing then fine and then then well and if we've got nothing we've got a problem yeah because you've got something you don't understand acting with impunity in the very training area off the coast right here where our finest and most powerful battle groups test their weapons and hone their crews yeah. you have an exotic technology that's running circles around yeah that would be wild yeah i wish it, but it makes too much sense for them to actually do that. You know, it's too logical. So uh, who knows? We'll see. What do you actually expect? Sorry, were you going to say something? I was just going to say that the question is, is at this point, what is there to hide? Yeah, yeah. And and what is the the intention of the people kind of, yeah, pushing this in in the high places? Maybe people we don't even know, kind of faceless, nameless people. Who, what what do they actually, yeah, what are the motivations and everything? Um what do you expect now? I think I asked you this last time, but obviously things have changed a bit since then and things have moved forward. What do you expect to unfold 
over the next say six months to 12 months um, over the next year in regards to yeah transparency disclosure hearings all of this kind of thing well um i think that something i'm really looking forward to is uh lou's book lou elizondo has, yeah, has I, can't wait. I have not seen it um no advanced reads on it really looking forward to reading it hoping do you know it, when we're supposed to get like when it's supposed I'm to drop? The summer. I'm hoping yeah. that I, I believe the hope is this summer um, because we know how these things are, are, are written when it's folks coming out of the government. OK, these are not this is not a fictional tell all where names are changed and it's a cool story and you can cherry pick it and take what resonates. This it has this will be something that has had to pass the, the checks and balances, mm. you know, with the DOD and that it's capable of being published. And if I know Lou, he's gonna he's going to say every dang thing he can yeah. uh, legally within that book. So I really look forward to that. I have I am I'm making an assumption here that it's going to be um, a bombshell. Mm -hmm. I'm making an and I may be wrong. People can can you know, cool cool. When I'm wrong later, let me know. But I have a feeling that the repercussions from his from his book are going to be wide ranging. I think that they're going to probably shake up a lot of trees and have a lot of people come out of the woodwork um, that might not have before. Because let's be frank, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to be the first one to volunteer. But once you see somebody else doing it, 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 it gets easier to get in line behind them. So I think that's going to really shake things up. I think especially gonna... because people will know that it got signed off as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about whether or not there's nonsense in there. If it's not opinion, it's going to be fact. Mm. Um, beyond that, you're going to get to know somebody that's really important to me that I think, uh, you know, we all hesitate to use words like this, but at this point it's, it's pretty, um, it, it's pretty obvious. Lou's an American hero. Uh, him and Chris and others like them, they did something that no one else was able to do. They, they made sure that this subject once they peeled it out of, of the Pentagon and once they started talking to the rest of us about it, they haven't given up. They haven't gone anywhere. They haven't um, compromised their ethics. So those folks are heroes to me. So I, I really think that um, this is historical. I think what we're, what we're looking at and what we're going to see is going to really help things. Now, why does that have to come out in a person's book? Well, because the government's still not telling us what the hell's going on. Let's be real. It's it, At this point, it is condescending. Um, they jump to, oh, no aliens here. And we're back to the stigmatized headlines. Yeah. Um, and the, the answer from Senator Gillibrand and others should be great. Tell us where they are. Don't tell us where they aren't. Take us to the interesting information and let's get to the bottom of it and stop with, stop with the nonsense. Um, we don't have time for it. There's a, there, you know, there's a war in Europe. Uh, the world is destabilized. The inflation's at an all time high. Um, the economy is is in general in the West is is dubious at best, um, and the world stage is just a bunch of saber rattling at the moment. Whether it's whether it's Taiwan or the or the direct conflicts that are occurring in the world, so it just doesn't seem like a time for nonsense. It doesn't seem like a time for for any more BS. I don't want to swear. Um, I just feel it really deep in my chest right now. Um, it's a time for courage and conviction. It's a time for truth telling and pragmatism. Uh, politics should die. We we need we need effort from yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. We need to yeah make things better. Politics doesn't do that. Politics should die. I, I guess in its current form. Um, and and that's huge in in a sense what you say in the fact that your response to what are your hopes and kind of expectations for the year. We mostly talk about Lou's book, and that's not you know to say that you're not absolutely right like in a way i think most people would have higher expectations coming from that than from more hearings and than from governments telling us what they know because i guess we have no faith left in in those kind of institutions right and in, in them doing the right thing obviously we still have hope we still hope but expectation no I'm a I'm a middle of the road person with my politics, and that's not because I'm a fence sitter or I'm unafraid to take a stand. It's just because my beliefs don't fit into one little pocket. Um, but we, we've just we've seen ourselves 
over the last 10 years. And I know very few people who will not choose a side, even in flavor or tone. When I, you know, they might say, even like me, I might say I'm a moderate, but I would be the, but if I had to choose, I would say that I leaned more liberal. I'm a very socially liberal person. I'm, a, I'm an artist and I'm a weirdo, you know, according to a lot of people. But that said, a lot of my values lie on the right as well. And for some reason, all of us have been convinced to choose a side. Mm. And I would love for all of us to take just deep breath, get off of that side, get back to being a person instead of a, you know, a teammate, a, a member of a cadre or a, or a tribe or a, you know, of, of a, of a, of a uh, dualistic argument and just start saying, are you getting what you want? Are you getting what yeah. you need? Do you feel safe? Are, you know, yeah. let's start talking to each other again because we've given so much agency to to our institutions and to our celebrities and to our you know the the I always point to my television when we're when I'm on these interviews <laughs> the things that talk at us yeah. and very few of us are are have the mental energy left to form our own opinions. Um. So you and I are, you know, we're, we're off the topic of UFOs right now, but it's, it's the, the state of the world almost allows zero solution at the moment. Mm. I think and, there's been studies. A lot of people don't even want to make their own decisions. They, they want, you know, to be told what to do. And, and you're absolutely right with how we've been separated into these sides and what people need to realize more than anything, you know, yeah, you can realize that your side is actually not that dissimilar to the other side, but the biggest realization is it's all fake, you know, yes. right wing, left wing, you know, it's all nonsense, really. Like you said, you got to look at like, how are you living? How are there other people living? What's your quality of life like? What is about those people with the worst quality of life? Do they deserve that based on X, Y, and Z? Or is that wrong? I, I watched nothing to do. a video of a woman. Um, it, said, it, it said, this is how the rips in your jeans are made. And she's got like a rotary tool. And she's just putting these holes in the jeans over and over again she's wearing a respirator she's covered with this fluff and, and let me just put it this way the conditions the work were horrid this was obviously mm -hmm. a third world country and i'm thinking to myself i got a couple of pairs of jeans upstairs that came with the rips i didn't want anybody to go through that mm. just so i got ripped jeans yeah and i'm like the, the amount of money that person made for me to have those ripped jeans versus the amount of money i paid and it's like how much of my life and just i've talked about this with folks too about this thing which we all we all i don't we, none of us want to say we love these things but we can't live without them they're always in our hands mine's right next to me when i'm on an interview like what's that about but i do know that people were in hellish conditions to create that why am i still why am i still buying it why do i feel like i need it why do i still buy the jeans it's like this isn't a this isn't a political argument this is a human conversation. Mm -hmm. Why have we decided that we're okay to live in a world where others suffer so we can feel good? I didn't consent to that. I don't. And, and, and you know, a lot of people would say, well, throw away your phone, throw away your TV, go move to the woods and, and live like a hermit. I really can't do that. There's a few, there's places in this country where we have, you know, Bureau of Land Management and there's rules and I could go out there and do that. But still, there's always limits. There's not a place on this planet that you can go as a sovereign individual. Not a fan of that word because you still got to pay your tax. I, I agree. We all have to, if we're going to have a consensus reality and live in it together, we have to agree to the rules. So pay your taxes, you know, stop at the red light, go on the green and let the pedestrians go first. But there's not a spot on the earth that you can go and just be Ben and live, die, or survive in an environment without being beholden to another person and responsible to them either for your well-being or responsible for their well-being. Mm. So it's a it's tough when because then that brings up the question: Do we have free will if you ultimately are unable to exercise it? It would depend as well, doesn't it, on financial situation. Obviously, the worse off you are financially, the more you are constrained by all of this stuff, by having to buy stuff that, yeah, causes it's negative like a, effects. It's like a and, funnel. Yeah. 
And the less resources you have, the less choices you have. Yeah. And the more resources you have, the more likely you are to be profiting when the, the people with the less resources buy the thing that, you know, like the whatever jeans or some food that somebody had to, you know, pick by hand and get cut all up or anyway. Yeah. It's, uh... and, and a lot and folks will say, well, that's the natural system. That's um, that's the that's the well, market. <laughs> yeah. I, I, how do we get and I know that. So many people are turned off by this wishy, they call it wishy-washy, hippie thinking, all this other stuff. But is there a point in our development as a species where we're going to decide to care about ourselves as a whole instead of ourselves as individuals or individuated tribes or, or nation states? Where is the council in the world? Where is the city or the think tank or the place where the great leaders of the world the thought leaders, the 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 philosophers and the scientists and, and not just the talking heads that we see on television that teach us how the sun shines and how the planets move and 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 that, but the the true thinkers of the world, where are they meeting to solve these problems and why aren't they? We've got financial meetings that occur. Unfortunately, I think they do meet, don't they? It's just they talk about how they can take more money out of our pockets next year rather than like you know rather than okay so we're actually we've caused some pretty major problems to the climate and we're we're really wrecking people's quality of lives in in half of these areas how can we sort that out no, they just don't care unfortunately but you're right like when when are we going to reach a point as a as a civilization where where we do care and the caring filters through to the top so you can have power and money and status and still care because obviously it does seem like i don't know if i'd be immune it seems like maybe that's a human condition you know once you get into a position to actually make a change it seems like all you care about is money i can't say i'd be different because i've never been there i like to think i'd be different but who knows maybe you have to be that kind of person to ever get to those places i i don't know yeah i I often am approached by people who are, to me, from my perspective, in more powerful positions or have greater influence than I do. And they're often asking me, what are, what, what's the solution? What do we do? How can I help? And I'm constantly up against the same wall. It's like, well, I don't have any resources. I, 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 I lack reach and I lack resources. Um, I can, I have ideas and I can direct things in a, in a certain way. And I, I know folks. Um, but at the end of the day, I can't pay you. I can't pay me. I can't, I can barely bring the donuts to the meeting. So we're back to that problem where is it just that once you accrue safety and wealth and well being for yourself, that the human condition is to hoard that? And that, you know, it is a, philosophical and ideological r rising above that become that that breeds philanthropy mm. um I, I love listening to warren buffett talk about how little money he needs but he still has it he has a yeah. plan to no longer have it when he's you know after he goes but he still has it and he talks about living very simply and everything else and I don't know what the answer is. Um, I just know that, that that the resources in this world have been polarized to to a, a finite number of people. Um, yeah. And we are deluded enough to talk about folks like Elon Musk as the richest man in the world. While you've got Saudi princes and other oligarchs in the world who are off the books completely and have bank accounts and, or resources that are probably numbering closer to the trillions now at this point because i think a lot of people don't understand that over the let's say the last hundred years we've realized that money is also finite we understand inflation we understand the gold standard we understand how much silver is there we know what resources are in the world money is kind of like water in a lot of ways in that you can track the way it is moved over time around the world it doesn't go away it only changes in value over time. And there's a lot of money. We don't know where it went. Yeah. A lot of money, like enough money to build a planet. I don't mean to get people, <laughs> you know, get people's ideas up in the, into science fiction, but where the heck is that money? What's, yeah, yeah. what's it doing? You know, I, I, money is this invisible resource, but it's, it's required on this planet to get anything done. 
Yeah. Every country's in like enormous debt now. And it's just become like a rolling joke. Oh. Like every year, like the national debt. How like, are we? What now? Debt? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, 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 but we are the world. Yeah. Whom are we in debt to? Our, ourselves, I believe. I don't, I, what a joke. It's just, that, it's just. What does that mean? It's like getting a shady accountant to do your books. And he's like, okay, so we'll do. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. And, and for me as well, the last thing I'll say before let's try and get back to UFOs is you mentioned Elon there. So mm -hmm. I'll use him as, as my example, but I'm really talking about any kind of billionaire. But you can go lower, you know, to, you know, whatever, like multimillionaires probably apply in some capacity. But let's go to the extreme example. So if I'm Elon. I don't know how old he is, whatever, 50, 50s, 60, I don't know. But what do you want to achieve at that point? You know, you, you set off, you wanted to make a success from your business. Okay, done. Want to be super rich. Okay, done. Maybe I want to be a billionaire. Okay, done, done, uh, done many times over. Just thinking from even the selfish point of view now of like, okay, what would I want just for myself purely? I would want legacy, right? You want to be remembered. You want to go down in history. Do you want to go down as somebody that, you know, everybody hates? Do you want to go down as like a, obviously he's not Hitler. I'm not going to compare him to Hitler. But do you want to go down as somebody that has a bad name and, is you know, whenever somebody mentions your name, it's negative connotation. Or do you want to spend your however many billion at this point, your hundreds of billions, I think it is, isn't it, on literally changing the planet and, and having your name on the turnaround where we completely yeah turn around all the negative effects we're, we're we're having on the planet you change quality of life for people in in the numbers of billions of people um just one person elon musk could have that that different he could make that difference and he could have like i say the selfish reward of going down and having that legacy and everybody would love him even i if he started doing all that i'd be like wow elon we need more elons in the world but you're not going to catch me saying that for now. He's too busy, you know, like making people pay $8 on Twitter for a blue tick and spending like a billion pounds on, on an American football team. Or I don't know if that's happening, but yeah, let's, let's, let's go back to UFOs, I guess. Have your last word on, on it before we go. <laughs> I think it would be a lot easier to terraform Earth than Mars. Yeah. If um, I, I wish that Elon had, a, had another side to his coin that is uh his his don't keep all your eggs in one basket um i would agree with that but you don't take your eggs and put them in the fox's hole either mm -hmm. um and keep them there that that planet is a desert it's a wasteland if we're just talking about conserving the human genome off of this one source that we're aware of where it resides i think that's a great idea but i wish that the other side of that coin was that he would be applying his his level of acumen and care to things like the fact that we have microplastics at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Yeah, we've screwed up. Whether you're whether you're on the right or on the left and believe in hu in the human um, involvement in long term climate change, mm. we've littered every inch of this planet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just look outside, wherever you are. Just <laughs> and it's time walk. to do something about that. Yes, and, and and I think that we we should also, you know, we need to move back to the idea that climate change occurs whether we're here or not, because mm -hmm. this is a dynamic universe. Mm -hmm. We are obviously a part of this. What can we undo that we've done? We should yeah. be doing that. It's as as humanity has no rules right now. Mm, no, I mean we're just barely None. not using nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah we're, we're we're unbelievable and even if you take away the climate change which as you kind of mentioned or allude to like it kind of politicized a little bit and some people disagree and so but even if we take away the whole concept of climate change like just look outside it's a mess look what we've done we're like a bunch of kids that you left in the house and you just come back and there's toilet paper everywhere and food all over the floor and vomit you know and there's there's, there's a baby injured in the garden like we've just Look at it. It doesn't matter where the climate change, in a way, it doesn't matter. Like, look at the stuff we're pumping into the sky. Look at the stuff we're putting in the oceans. Look at the things we're putting in our bodies. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we it's have, we're talking about a philosophical split here, though, that there are folks, and without making it a religious discussion, there are people on earth that believe they have a manifest destiny, that they were given this world mm. to utilize, exploit, enjoy. Um, mold as they see fit there are other people that feel a stewardship that feel a kinship to the environment to the plants to the animals 
and everything else. Is it as simple as that dichotomy? It's not good versus evil. Um, in a lot of ways, it's it might maybe it's materialist versus spiritualist. But um, but I'm I'm really at a loss. We're we're just we seem so more dualistic now to me than I can see in the past. Um, and I try to parry that against everybody thinks they're living in the end times. Um, you know, I one of the things I spoke at at a conference recently was people were asking me about um, an apocalyptic revelatory feel to the whole UFO phenomenon. Mm. And, and one of the things I brought up is we have far more apocalyptic prophets than we do actual apocalypses. Um, but then we started talking about singularities and, you know, first of all, we, we revisited where that word comes from. That's the event horizon. You know, that's, that's the singularity at the heart of a, of a bl black hole that we're talking about a point of no return. That's what a singularity is. So a technological singularity is a point of no return in technology, but the Bronze Age collapse must have seemed like a singularity to those living through it. And whatever the our memory of the Great Flood or Great Floods were that formed those myths must have seemed like a, a major paradigm shift yeah. um, in singularity to those people. And we could add numerous things throughout history. So we're facing some kind of cycle. Um, the sociological data tells us that we are in a period of collapse and i'm not a naysay i'm not a i'm not a doom prophet or anything like that but i do enjoy statistics and big data and we're seeing a a downward slide a devolution of of, of society at the moment mm -hmm. as we're seeing a skyrocket of technological achievement and ability so i'm no longer afraid to say i think we're headed face first towards a wall that is a singularity of some kind yeah um, i just don't know what's on the other side and I find it very interesting that that aliens are back on the menu. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know what's on the other side. Hopefully we're going to be around to find out, though. Um, yeah. Let's go back to UFOs for a little bit. Um, politics is fun, but I, I, yeah. but also incredibly depressing. Um, Ruins the comments section. Yeah. <laughs> so what was I going to ask you next? So, yeah. So we were talking about what's going to happen this year. And you mentioned the hearings and whistleblowers and things like that. Do you know anybody personally that's going to come forward um, or that has come forward? I know folks who have testified already. Um, can't say where, when or how, but the process is ongoing. Um, and I have been I've had some pretty high numbers of, of the number of people that have been contacted, shared with me. Um, a lot of people should keep their ego out of it. Uh, if you haven't been contacted, perhaps your story is already a matter of record that's been explained a lot. Uh, remember, this isn't about us as individuals. This is about data. This is about learning and understanding. Yeah. Um, so nobody should be offended if they aren't called and, and nobody should feel, uh, you know, should, should, you know, you know, bet the farm if they are called. Uh, this mm -hmm. is, this is informational. Um, but there's a lot of people ready to tell their the truth that they're aware of and yeah. add it to the to the to the mound of other truths and finally figure out what the heck is the commonality between all of them yeah we just we're just hoping they get the the platform the opportunity and and that we get to hear about it um i'm sure you've been asked this many times i don't think i asked you last time we spoke anything about this but um how confident are you or do you believe first of all do you think that the us government or any other government have recovered a craft that is, how do we say it? Not of non-human origin, I guess, is the easiest kind of way to put it. Um, do you, do you believe that that has happened? And if so, how confident are you that that has happened? And do you have kind of a, a rough ballpark of maybe how many times, whether they have multiple of these craft. You know, just what are your thoughts and and ideas on that? Given what I would call um integral rumors or rumors with integrity that have a yeah. good um grounded good, rumors good pedigree say that uh that that a craft was recovered in the 1930s by the italians that that craft made its way to berlin and then that craft was um or was recovered and returned to the united states 
those rumors seem to corroborate with certain things that uh that look like they're in the the historical record um mm. some some forms paperwork telegrams and other things like that support that possibility i've always stood by the fact that i believe roswell was exactly what it looked like to mm -hmm. the rest of us yeah. um the telegram that is held in the the marcel photograph that you know everybody's tried to figure out what it says it says enough to me to say that this was a initial mistake of truth telling and then a cover up to make it go away mm -hmm. and so i believe that whatever crash there was recovered um the again the the rumor mill with pedigree says that there were pilots that looked very different from us that were smaller um and that one may have survived um beyond that i wouldn't want to get too more specific with it how long did it survive who did it speak to how did it speak where did it come from what did it say um we've got differing avenues there of of how we want to look at that um but there are a lot of things that occurred after that point that that speak to something uh very shortly after roswell uh the air force was the uh the air force was formed as their own entity they were broken mm -hmm. out of the army air corps yeah um there were other things that followed on after that with the way that, the, that programs popped up and went away um mm -hmm. there's a a little known program called um interloper that is alleged with a i believe lieutenant colonel dewey fournay who was a part of project blue book but there is evidence that says that the interesting data was removed and taken elsewhere outside of the program by colonel fournay where is that data now if it's not classified what can we do with it where can we find it um i think we we're we're facing a something really similar to what, what when Donald Rumsfeld talked about, we have knowns, we have unknowns, we have known unknowns, and we have unknown unknowns. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that sounds like word salad and garbage, but our known is that something's been going on for quite a long time. Our known is that for sure back to the 1930s, leadership military and the intelligence uh complex that surrounds that whole that whole cadre has been discussing these anomalous craft has been trying to shoot them down and identify them and recover them um when the united states government in the guise of bill clinton said that project mogul was the origin of a lot of the um the confusion around Roswell in regards to bodies. The most casual observer, when 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 looking at that retraction or that that nonsensical cover that they tried to provide, it just doesn't work. Those were yeah. full size mannequins. They, it was years later. Um, the, the details don't match up. Again, bad police work uh, on anybody who accepted that. So. Those things need to be revisited. They need to be discussed. And most of that information only exists on late night TV, um, you know, UFO documentaries, and which are still unfortunately niche for the UFO community. They're not understood or known by the general public or they're not taken seriously as historical details. But these are true and, and real details that occurred. Um, what are they? we're we're this takes me back to world war ii right afterward um most of us are, are at this point familiar with operation paperclip <clears throat> operation paperclip is where the united states government basically got the scientists that didn't go to prison after the nuremberg trials and after the war and brought them to the, to the united states and made them texan americans and and uh you know and they became our space program yeah now the thing that that's that's interesting in itself but what people have to understand is that the russians had their own version of operation paperclip and that the united states received the nuts and bolts scientists the people that understood material technology propulsion airframes weapon systems 
the, the newly minted Soviet Union received all of the people that were interested in consciousness, mm -hmm. in manipulation, in frequency and psi and channeling or whatever the, these these subtler aspects of, of the mental realm are. So you're looking at two divorced ideolo ide ideologies, but then the United States puts together a battle fleet immediately following a world war at a time when, when recovery, uh, rebuilding, reunite, reuniting families, all these mm -hmm. things have to occur they took an entire fleet down to Antarctica simply for explorational purposes. Yeah. And that fleet did not return whole and intact with all of its sailors and all of its ships. And on the return home, Admiral Ford, or excuse me, um, oh, geez, my mind went blank. It's not Admiral Forrestal. Admiral Byrd, returning from, from that, who was in charge of the mission, is returning making his way back home with the fleet, stopping in South America and giving interviews where he is he is bothered about a foe coming over the poles in the in a future war. And there's there's an there's a number of other really dubious um data points that surround this to include later Admiral Forrestal's strange uh falling out of a window and dying at, at the naval hospital. Um, bad police work that ignores all this stuff. Lots of great researchers out there that have pulled this stuff out. I'm not the, this is not my original work. I'm pulling data points from other folks. These things need to be examined. There has yeah. been a huge cover up for 75 years. Um, it does surround physical craft and probable physical bodies of something different than us with an origin that remains unknown to the rest of us and a cadre of now hundreds of thousands if not millions of people who claim to have encountered these same things and they have differing views to share as to why they're here and what they want something's going on this is not fake this isn't a psyop although i'm sure that any government involved with it has some level of manipulation around this topic that that you know it does seem to be the highest level powerful information that one can understand is what's really going on surrounding uh, the UFO phenomenon. Yeah. Wow. So much fascinating stuff in there that I could try and unpack or try and go back to. Um, I wanted to kind of ask you about the, the bodies and like how confident you are that that is accurate, but you kind of just said that probably. So I guess that will... The rumors appear to be true. Yeah. Yeah. as as well as any rumor can be can be called a probable fact we're we're stuck with 75 years of information but we're all just waiting for relevant authority to give us the thumbs up and at different different times relevant authority has done that where does your relevant authority stop is it a colonel in the air force is it a general is it an admiral in the navy is it a secretary of defense is it a gs15 working in the d ring of the, of the pentagon um, yeah. I've reached my level of confidence in this. I've, I've met people where, where my believe button has been pushed on something I can't touch yet. Mm -hmm. Um, the evidence as a, as a, as a lifetime law enforcement officer and investigator, Frank, I mean, my whole adult life has been spent trying to solve mysteries. Um, something's going on. Yeah, something yeah. big's going on and it involves probably 8 billion people. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you can't put it any other way. Yeah, something big, something huge. Just what is it? <laughs> Just want to know. The, the Antarctica thing that you mentioned with the, the this expedition or whatever, this exploration expedition that they went down and lost some people. And what do you make of that? Like, what do you what do you think of the ties to Antarctica? And have you have you had any thoughts around it? It's still classified. That's the first thing that we should bring up. And we should say to ourselves, why the heck? Is a yeah, National yeah. Geographic jaunt down to the poles still classified? From Why, in like when it? was it? The fifties, early fifties, or late forties? Yeah, late forties. Uh, right, immediately following the war, at a time when you okay. would be sending people home to their families. You don't pack them yeah. up on a boat for another six months and send them down to the the bottom of the world like that. No. So there's obvious trails of information to follow. There's numerous post-World War II um, German activity with U-boats in Argentina and down around that area. And this is where all of the rumors begin that I don't like playing with. Because unfortunately, 
In the last 20 years, a number of people have come forward stating that they know what's going on and have profited to a great deal by building um, fictional networks of stories around themselves about the secret space program and all of this other thing. But without mentioning their names, when these people come up, when their livelihood is on the line and when they're testifying in a divorce settlement or something revol revolving around their money, without hesitation, they say, this is all entertainment this was all fictionalized and made up and the fans who want to believe it they stay and the people who you know and other people leave we've seen this happen so is this disinformation is it just narcissistic greed and storytelling where do the folks who don't have the same level of confidence and haven't testified that they're lying what do, what do they do with the information so i want to throw that out there this is very muddy water we're about to talk about mm. But we do have it. What, why did we go down there? I would assume we went down there to route out any any escaping Nazi influence after World War II. I'm bothered by now. Is that what we were chasing? Is that what this remnant was looking for as well? This is where the mystery begins. What happened? Were there Germans? down south at antarctica were there exotic craft there is that who we fought that's what the rumor is and and the the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming the direct physical evidence that remains is nearly zero mm -hmm. um i so i don't want to i don't want to go too much farther I, there's a mystery that lies there declassifying project um high jump would would be the way to go um speculating past that would 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 pay into the secret space program um 20 and back weird i i say it's weird i don't understand it i can't find a purchase in reality i can find details that are familiar but not a, a not paint it with a broad brush of, of truth yeah so That's there's fascinating some, the... some, some kind of misinformation surrounding that whole thing mm. Yeah, but it sounds like something that I would like to hear more about. I'm going to have to try and look into that a little bit more. It's, uh, yeah, fascinating. You mentioned just then kind of about how, yeah, we tried to, we, when I say we, kind of anybody, in hu any human really, have tried to shoot these things down. Um, you mentioned the one in Italy that, that you believe was shot down and, and recovered. Um, I guess my question is, if whoever is behind, say, a Tic Tac, if they didn't want to be shot down, do you think the U.S. would have the capabilities to shoot them down right now? Because it's one of the and and if they did have the capabilities to shoot down a tic tac that's trying to be evasive, do you think then that they would actually do it? I guess that one's probably easier to answer. I guess they probably would. Well, I would say let yes me you answer. <laughs> I would say, say yes across the board. I would. Um, I'm not proud of that, but capability. If it's technology, absolutely. Um, you can throw a rock. You can be a you can be a, a an orangutan and throw a rock into the intake of an F eighteen, mm -hmm. and disable that aircraft and destroy it. Um, there's always going to be a weak point in technology that can be exploited, um, and if you can discover that, then then that's how you would counteract that. Um, yeah. There the rumor around. Uh, just because just people will, will will bring it up or at least it'll come up in their head. The rumor around Roswell has to do with either lightning strikes or EMP or or other things like this. Um, a lot of people like to say, oh, there's no way that would happen. They, We have no idea. <laughs> it don't assign anything other than what you can observe. The five observables just tell you that this is probably physical in some nature. That it is manifested in this reality as a, as, a, as a physicality, not just as an energetic force or an, or interesting ball lightning or uh, sentient plasma per se. But when we're talking about craft here, we're talking about something that is that is it's technology. So mm. it does not. When I hear from the Italians most recently, so World War II, we just or pre World War II nineteen thirties, we discuss a craft that was allegedly shot down by the Italians. Mm. Um, people will say well why weren't we shooting them down all over the place we can speculate that the te that the whatever's behind this technology seems to up their game anytime we get within detection range 
Yeah. Um, the USS Princeton upgraded their Aegis radar, detected Tic Tacs. Well, we're still not picking up constant Tic Tac activity on the radar. Um, the fleet on the East Coast upgraded the F-18's radar systems. They were picking up these uh, cubes within spheres and other things on their sorties for a while. Then they were not any longer. Um, so if if the Italians, not the 1930s one, but the one that was discussed with um, on the television show Unidentified, where a one of, a mod, modern day Italian leadership from their military discussed hitting a UAP with a with a depleted uranium round and damaging that UAP, and that UAP then fired some kind of energy weapon at the tail of the helicopter that fired the round and disabled the helicopter. To me, there, there's going to be a level, an, an end level of this technology. A depleted uranium round is a very dense piece of matter. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there, there's going to be a, a, a defense against something that dense. The only, you know, you don't get much denser than that unless you, you yeah, know, you're getting yeah. into, you know, exotic matter or neutronium and things like that. So the fact that that might have an effect on what we're observing going on with this craft um, doesn't surprise me. So I don't think they're infallible. I don't think that we're, uh, and yes, I think if we were, if we had the ability and if we, I don't know that we would uh, exercise much restraint in, in trying to shoot one down. Mm. If if they if they did try and shoot one down nowadays, you know, like, well, they kind of did recently. But if they, if they did, it kind of makes me think that they should know a lot more than they're telling us. Because I, if I was in charge of a country or a, a military, I certainly would not be shooting down something that I have no idea where it's from or who's behind it. Or you know, you, you, I don't necessarily want to be starting a fight with a mystery uh, a, a mystery presence. Um, but yeah, I get, I get, get what you're saying that they would. <laughs> I don't think any military is perfect or necessarily benevolent per se. Yeah, I, they are, yeah. they are, they're the swords of the people. Um, however, I think that we do do our best to protect our folks. I, um, I don't understand the idea of shooting down an unknown non-threat. Mm. Um, and so I assume as, as I think you just stated, we must know what we were shooting down. So either we're not being told, we're not worried about it, or yeah. this is a distraction of some kind. Yeah. Well, we must at least have a pretty good idea. Um, so talking of crafts that we've recovered and, and potential bodies, like, and, and then to obviously get to the question of kind of what is behind them. We did talk about that a little bit last time. I think you're on the side of non-human intelligence. I recently spoke to Michael Masters, Dr. Mm -hmm. Michael Masters, um, and I want to get your take on, yeah, the future human hypothesis. What do you, what do you think about that? Do you, have you given it thought? Um, I've been giving it a lot of thought lately. And in fact, um, in part because I saw that, that Dr. Masters was one of your guests. And I've had um, internal mental beef with him for a while. And so it's maybe we should, maybe he and I should chat. I want to discuss what is time. I'll get you on together. What, what it means to be human. Um, but I think I want to actually dial back some of my disagreement with his generalized theory. And only folks offline are going to know about this. Um, but I have been against his theory about time traveling humans. I really enjoyed his book. Um, I have a personal um reticence to find any one point source for the phenomenon however i don't think of time linear any longer i don't think of past present future except in the way that my memory perceives it um i believe that physics teaches us that time is not linear um that we experience and perceive it in a linear fashion because that is otherwise it would be completely illogical yeah. Um, you and I would not have been able to meet up today for this if we had not invented time and coordinates and things like that. However, um, when I think of time, I envision dimensionality, and you know, as as in many folks who are familiar with Flatland, the book Flatland, or the the concept of dimensionality, that 
this is three dimensions plus time. So I have a, I live in a spatial universe, plus I perceive a linear progression of time. Mm -hmm. It speaks to me that a fifth dimension, because I have, I have wrapped my head around the way dimensions unfold in a, in a ge geometrical sense, when we're trying to represent them on paper in two dimensions, when we're drawing them, like, uh, how, a, how a, um, Oh boy, what's this stupid thing in Marvel called the blue thing, the um Tesseract? Is that it? No. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I think it is. I think you're right. Whatever it is, it's it's a 4D cube. Yeah. I think and it's um they, it's represented in the only way that you and I can really wrap our heads around what a 4D cube would be in three dimensions. So I digress a, a great bit, but the fifth dimension to me is kind of like on this tattoo I have. This is this is to me, this is where we live. We live in this three-dimensional box. There's a, a an arrow of time that intersects, and then there are the remainder of the dimensions that 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 ray off of that point. To me, the fifth dimension of time would be very much like seeing time in a in a in a cube. Yeah. No longer moving on a line. There's there there are dimensions to the time. There is back, forth, left, right, up, down. And, and angular directions. So to me, I'm okay with saying that these are time traveling humans because time is not linear. They're not all coming from the future to me. Time is not the way we think of it. I, I, I think we have a hard time truly perceiving what time is. The second portion I would say is, what does it mean to be human? I've, I've graduated to this idea that everyone is human. Every thinking thing is human because the source thing that is ambulating this, this body and that is doing the thinking and the feeling and the hurting and the loving is something that I believe from my personal experience with my own NDEs and OBEs that I transcend this specific existence. So to me, it's not a great leap to think that 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 oneness that we all discuss in all of our philosophies and religions and, and things like that, that beyond this life, that oneness exists. And that in this life, we're just looking at different, a diff the same cast of characters wearing different suits and playing different roles and enjoying some kind of existence. Um, so when we get to that, yep, I think he's right. It's time traveling humans. But that's, it's a lot of mental gymnastics to get to that simple broad statement, but I'm tending to agree more with Dr. Masters. Yeah. It's grown on you. It has. It has because I'm I'm I still use words like extraterrestrial and alien. But if I'm playing a um if I'm playing a video game on a specific server and a person that usually I'm playing on a US server Okay, and um, and someone from a European server comes over and starts playing with me. Are they an alien? Yeah. Um, we we put ourselves in boxes. We look to tribalize. We look to to form teams and and say this is what I am like, and they are what I am like, and so we're a we, and you're different from us, so you're a they, and um. I'm not sure it's it's like that. I have a feeling we're all involved in a really interesting and, and dynamic play together. Yeah, yeah, really interesting thoughts. And yeah, the whole time thing is such a such a mind boggling road to go down. But um, but yeah, thanks for sharing your thoughts. And yeah, I appreciate it. It's interesting. If you if you do at some point want to have a have a chat with um with Michael, I'll be oh, able to get to. you both on together. We could okay. kind of go deep on it. That'd be a uh, be interesting. Um. Psi phenomena. We talked about it a bit last time. We talked about your time with the Monroe Institute and things like that. I just wondered whether there were any other particularly memorable experiences that you've had in in these areas that maybe we didn't touch on last time. Any kind of remote viewing, precognition, anything, anything remotely connected. My favorite example is, um, and and I want I want folks to the entry level. For psi phenomena should not be grand gestures of of prophecy or telekinesis. Uh, folks should understand that that where you're first going to notice these subtle aspects 
of our reality are in what most of us call synchronicities. Mm -hmm. And a synchronicity for most folks is best described as a coincidence beyond coincidence. Um, it that the um, although I am a believer, everything happens for a reason because of the way physics operates. You know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, etc. Um, but sometimes the 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 world seems to line up in a way that is too profoundly coincidental. And so, my favorite example was shortly after I had begun to experience a string of synchronicities. Um, so powerful that I, that I really did, um, question my sanity. Um, I was, I was going to therapy at the time for just some trouble and transitioning out of the military and was able to add that to what we were talking about. But I would become very, I'd had a string of synchronicities that had really kind of shaken me, um, because it almost felt like I was able to interact with the environment in a way that I hadn't been able to before and that I didn't think we were supposed to be able to, to elicit responses from nature and from the environment. And I'd seen plenty of people online who were both having fun, but both deluded over the idea that they might be creating wind and things like that. And, and I've seen other people try to fake people out and I've seen other people do have very legitimate efforts and, and success, but I was explaining to a very uh, close family member of mine the direct story of Carl Jung and the scarab beetle that he discusses when talking about synchronicities. He had a patient who was discussing a dream about um, Egypt and, and scarab beetles, and basically one flew in the window, and he found it so profound that that would happen, that that was what ended up being the, the center point of, of Carl Jung's synchronicities. As I'm explaining this to her, I hold out my hand and I say, and it just flew right in the room, a large scarab or a black beetle landed in my hand the moment that I said that. And we all just kind of looked at it and a calmness came over me, a, a, a feeling of connection, of, of leaning into it. And I did something I would never do. First of all, I didn't scream when the thing landed on my hand because I hate bugs and I sound like a little girl when I'm around them. I picked this thing up and put it on my shoulder and then just continued talking. And all my friends and family that were around me were just like, what's going on? And I've always held on to that. that that's always been my favorite synchronicity. In those moments, you can elicit those moments. You can walk out of your house and say, I want to see purple hearts and go for a walk and just be present, not, not stuck up in our mind thinking about the grocery list and next week's party and, you know, and all this other stuff, but just enjoy, take in. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to end up seeing that. Now, folks who are staunch in their stubborn non-belief will say, that's just a coincidence. Cool. You're right. Just a coincidence for you. And tonight you're just going to have dreams and this is just going to be this life as long as you think that way. But for a lot of yeah. other people, they're realizing that those boundaries, they tell us something. There's more to this and you are a part of the system and you can elicit a response and it can be positive and, and thought provoking and, 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 um, it, it's that letting go. It's that yeah. letting your letting your ego possibly end up being wrong, letting your expectations be dashed, kind of laying down in the river and letting yourself just just float down, and then suddenly, the system goes, "Hey, I see you." Awesome, yeah, that's such a cool story. I can't believe that. It's, uh, it's wild, the uh, the beetle flying into your hand. Um, wow, yeah, I still need to have an experience like that. That's like. You know, like with that calm coming over you in a way, like, uh, yeah, I need, I need, maybe I'm still not quite letting go enough yet. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, into yeah. it. Like I've researched it. I'm aware of, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess maybe it's, maybe it's outside of my conscious control. Um, we'll see. What do you think about potential connections, links, overlaps, however we want to put it, um, between 
or, or with consciousness and the the world of consciousness you know it's obviously a big word and and ufos uap do you, what do you make of that and and i ask this quite frequently and i get completely different answers depending on who i'm talking to um so just kind of go wherever you want with it but yeah what do you what do you what do you think of all that what do you make of that potential i'm gonna use some strong words here i believe that um consciousness manipulation uh manipulation of perception and perceived reality is a weaponized aspect utilized by some aspect of this phenomenon um and if it's not there of course is the possibility that we are dealing with a um comorbidity of hallucination dream and i i will say the thing that a lot of people think i won't um weaponized um psychological warfare by state entities um or by um multinational corporations or frankly the powerful um our perception of our reality is based on frequency resonance um and, uh, and other subtle aspects that most of us don't think of on a day-to-day -day basis we can go back to that um the internet a couple of years ago presented us with a dress that was either uh, i recall gold and white or blue and black i recently yeah. did a uh, at my at a talk i recently gave i put that picture up and i asked i said raise your hand if it's blue and black about half the audience raise your hand if it's white and uh and gold about half the audience now i and then i asked raise your hand if you can switch it back and forth and a couple seconds later there are about four or five hands that went up and then i presented folks with the um if you're familiar with it it's a video of people playing basketball and the person uh the narrator mm -hmm. says count how many times the people in the white shirt pass the ball back and forth and so you get into your your mode and you're like okay i'm watching i'm watching watching and before you know it you're done and you're like 25 times or whatever the answer is and they're like cool did you see the gorilla walk through the middle and you you realize that while you were counting that a person in a gorilla suit walked through the middle of the basketball players and you never even noticed it so these give us the the entry into how simply our perception can be manipulated now we're in the territory of talking about things that that people call abductions um i have what people would consider abduction like memories but all of these memories are punctuated by a sleep period or a meditation period for me i don't have any memories of of being lucid and awake out of out in the world and encountering something like this mm -hmm. um i've seen things in the sky that looked a certain way and acted a certain way but nothing that i recall has ever come near you know what i mean like so for me they're all punctuated by a period of altered consciousness mm -hmm. so is that true for everyone it doesn't seem to be um there are numerous cases where where people have encountered things in broad daylight and and have similar aspects to them but the people the different everyone has perceived it differently everyone in the in, in the abduction group if it's a group abduction for lack of a better word are describing things differently now i know as a police officer on the one hand eyewitness accounts are a bread and butter he did it i recognize him he had blue shoes and a red shirt and you know and, and a handlebar mustache um but on the other hand we're horrible observers yeah we are, when there is a when there is a video tape we're bad it ends up being you didn't have a handlebar mustache you actually you know you had a you had a cue and a goatee and someone else was was sure you were wearing a blue shirt and red shoes not red shirt and blue shoes and it gets worrisome well the the lack of continuity across all of these cases reminds me of the lack of continuity across all nde and obe cases so first i line up all the lack of continuity these things don't match okay mm -hmm. now we lack up what does match what is what are the things that are that are similar across the board the only thing that i can gather is that these events are happening and that and that conscious memory is being manipulated 
That's all I can be sure of because I've watched um, probably two or 300 interviews with people who've had NDEs and OBEs at this point. And the only thing that scans across the board is that they are having this experience, that there is an in-between realm of some kind where we exist, where we communicate with each other, mm -hmm. and where we seem to plan and review these brief periods of existence. Um, so that said, if you have the, wherever the threshold level is, understanding of this technology, how the universe works, how to manipulate this frequency and vibration that feels solid, that I perceive as real and continuous, it seems that something understands how to manipulate that down to its its fundamental core level. Now, we're back to who is it? What is it? Hmm. Um, yeah, we could do a whole other show on based on what we talked about with World War II. Does that mean that the that the Russians were farther ahead than us on that? Do they have a better understanding how much of this could be an outside entity like the Russians manipulating public perception? I don't know. There's folks yeah. like Annie Jacobson that'll say that's the whole crux of the issue. Yeah, well, fascinating stuff, though. Um, hitchhiker effect. That's interesting. Um, and CE5. What are your thoughts on on those two kind of phenomena? The hitchhiker effect, um, one of the first things I was told when I met the folks who have been officially working on this, when I asked, I asked, why has this been happening to me my whole life? Why did this happen to my dad and my grandpa and probably my mom and my brothers and sisters? And they said, this is, this is a sticky portfolio. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, once this portfolio of things begins happening, it seems to stick to families and to individuals. Um, there's a lot of people out there in this community that will will go right to talking about our origins, our gods, bloodlines, historical events. Uh, there are other folks that will focus on manipulation of our genome or that we are a sociological experiment of some kind. Um, I have a feeling that the truth behind those things probably does lie at the top end of this phenomenon. It seems like there is something that, again, I'm using the word comorbidity, um, which might be the wrong word, but it's it, the the the, co the things that seem to be true across the board for everyone is that when they have a chance to communicate with the entities behind this, that those entities are familiar, often um, familial, that once the... Um, the terror of the unknown and that uncanny valley feeling of paralyzed, being paralyzed and frightened is lessened, that there is a voluntary aspect of this. But then we have people that come back absolutely frightened and state the opposite, absolutely involuntary, taken against their will. And you've got folks like me who I don't, I don't, I've never, I have no memory of ever being taken. I have memories of waking up in places I don't think I was supposed to be and usually reacting poorly. Um, I don't have evidence that those are actual UAP anything. They could be dreams. They could be, although I don't, the word hallucination to me is uh, we should unpack it at some point um, because it does seem like the unconscious is real. Yeah. Um, and it seems like we can communicate across that area when we're unconscious with each other somehow. Um, we've been unable to prove that to each other completely yet. I still think Dean Radin's work is fantastic proof that should just be immediately replicated and then, and then discussed further. Um, but people are afraid to do it because of the, the, the nature of the work. Um, I would love for, for us to, to make our new goal as humanity, instead of going to the moon and figuring out what we are. How long we've been here, where we came from, what are we? Yeah. Yeah. The real questions. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um 
Let me ask you a question from one of my patrons, one of my one of my magic five, the famous five. Um, <laughs> so this guy, this is Jimmy the Earthling. So hello, Sean. As someone with a similar path, I would be interested to hear how you transformed from a professional service member into a generally mellow, meditative type of person. Were either or UAP or psychedelics a component? Thanks, Jimmy the Earthling. I'm not a perfect person. Um, I have a lot of challenges in my life. I have a lot of areas that aren't going right. But um, it was it was the challenges that changed me. And it was having my expectations dashed enough times that I stopped tantruming each time that happened. Um, that I started to learn acceptance. Um, I decided to look inward at my own faults and try to stop blaming other people. I'm still really bad at it. Um, I, but I tried to do what I wish humanity would do. I tried to figure out who I am, why I'm here, what drives me, what do I want, what am I resisting? Um, and so when I'm able to remember that, I get to be a whole and authentic person. Um, when I forget it, I'm damaged. I'm scared. I'm fragile. I can be dishonest, um, just like just like everybody else. Um, I realize I do those things to protect my ego, um, and I do those things to protect the 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 boy in me who hasn't worked all his stuff out yet. Um, psychedelics did have had a play in that. Um, I've used them in a therapeutic fashion. Um, the research that has been done on uh, microdosing and its ability to lessen uh, the lasting effects of trauma, um, I believe, have a great deal of efficacy uh, used smartly and legally. Um, yeah, yeah. Did UAP have anything to do with it? Um, not necessarily. Uh, UAP in general frustrates me. Um, the 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 Loki trickster aspect of it is something that has always um, been something really hard for me to accept. Um, I'll, I'll finish by saying that I have a great deal of fear that surrounds the phenomenon. My interactions with it have have had fear and have frightened me or my perceived reactions. However. I would be very open to receiving an email or a telephone call and, you know, let's set up a meeting and tell me where you're going to land and, you know, and, and give me a little bit of something that is uh, easier to accept than just my consciousness changes. And then there's this strange situation. Um, I'd be totally open to that. Why can't I make that happen? I know they have the ability to email and to text and even come on they've, they've got these they've got this level of technology that we we do make these leaps these assumptions you know if we're gonna assume they can't be shot down well we're gonna assume they can watch this conversation that they're hearing us that they've accessed our internet that they can break our encryption perhaps mm -hmm. so why is an entity seemingly if it's real and I'll, and I'll give the debunkers the first the first the, go ahead say well you're crazy cahill sure maybe i am and I'm only talking about me. But why is this thing seemingly interested in me? But I can't figure out the handshake that they're willing to return. Um, a lot of folks will say it, it revolves around love, that it revolves around ascension, higher vibration and things like that. I have to say that when I have engaged heavily in those practices that, do, that raise your so-called vibration and, and change your mental aspect, I have um, perceived a, a, a uptick in positive interaction with something interesting and strange. Is that just euphoria and dopamine overloading my brain? I don't know. I'm half materialist, half spiritualist. Um, it, it's it's really strange. It's it's compelling when I am down and low. If I'm being negative, blaming, shaming drinking complaining the bad things that happen in my life seem to increase is that coincidence i don't know is that the phenomenon i think at the end of the day we are the phenomenon 
We're we're not living in a world. We're we are the we're part of this world, you know? Yeah. The conscious universe. Yeah. Yeah, well. Um God, I mean, you're good with words, Sean. You keep stumping me, and I'm like, I want to ask you about it, and I just get 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 trembling over my my words. Um, I talk too much. <laughs> no, no, it's it's good, it's good. I never knew you, obviously, when you were a, a young man, but um, so I don't know what you were like. But would you have ever imagined your life kind of turning out this way in terms of no longer being involved with the military and being kind of a meditator and uh, a very kind of as as Jimmy the Earthling said, mellow kind of at least that's the kind of persona I get, kind of mellow vibe and and involved with obviously UAP and interested in consciousness and psi and all this kind of stuff. Would you ever have yeah pictured it turning out like this? Yes and no. Um, if you'd asked me when I was probably eighteen or nineteen, I would have said yes. Um, going in the military really changed me, uh, hardened me. I always, and not in a, not in a, uh, not always in a positive way. Um, I'm sure that, you know, I, I, as with all of us, I'm sure if you came to my village and asked my people how mellow I was, they'd, they'd have some differing, uh, opinions of that. Mm -hmm. Um, folks on here get to see the best of me. They get to see me in a controlled environment where I'm calm and cool and collected. And, and I get to dive into spirit and kind of let myself riff. I'm I'm human like everybody else. I get my feelings hurt. I'm wrong. Um, for me, it's it's it's. I'm not a, I'm not Catholic. I'm not Christian, but I do really embrace the the philosophy of turning the other cheek. And I think what um what really did it for me was that. It's it's when you turn the other cheek, you're not just giving someone one more chance. Turning the other cheek indicates that you've you've already been struck. You're not offering the person a chance to beat you, even if you keep turning the cheek. You're offering them an opportunity to stop. You're offering them an opportunity to realize their mistake. Um I don't want to throw any more slaps in my life. I'm, uh, I'm mortified when I find myself doing that. Yeah. So, and I don't want to be angered anymore when I receive one. I want to turn yeah, that other yeah. cheek and offer that person the opportunity to, I can't remember if it was your podcast or somebody else's, um, but they, I think it was you, maybe you asked me if I had anything I wanted to say. And I said, yeah, it's never too late to stop being a dick. Yeah, I think that was here, yeah. And I still, I really believe in that, that if we can't give ourselves the opportunity to change, to forgive and and start again, we're just going to, we're just going to keep banging our heads against the same spot of our societal wall over and over again. Yeah. We can echo those, those words again from last time. It's never too late to stop being a dick. Wise words, wise words. Um, before I kind of move on a little bit onto something slightly different, um, just to go back to the things you mentioned, what, 10 minutes ago about these kind of experiences, not necessarily abduction or anything like that, but but that kind of led you to associate it with that kind of phenomenon. Um, did you have any like missing time? Um, or were there any other elements of all that that you feel comfortable mentioning now? Um, the only missing time I can really think about and um not talking about like driving in the car and flow state um for me the amount of uh <clears throat> studying i've done on flow state and things like that due to being a meditator like if i'm driving from here to downtown and i'm like i'll suddenly like oh what the heck happened in the last 10 minutes that happens to us sometimes that's not always a you know an abduction case yeah. however um my only piece of missing time has two other witnesses who remember it completely different than I did. And I'm, um, they had me, I had us seeing a green fireball in the sky and going home and discussing it, drawing it in separate rooms, trying to maintain a little bit of, um, uh, evidentiary efficacy and then sharing our accounts and going, wow. And thinking we saw a meteorite or maybe a UFO and then getting back to being teenagers my friends 
claim that we drove over the hill and up the mountain to Lick Observatory where I got out of the car while they were freaked out and interacted with these orbs that were flying around me and I was crying and laughing and doing all this other stuff. I have no memory of this whatsoever. The two friends that have shared this with me, they're, they're not fibbing. They're two different stories from two different people who don't talk anymore of an event that happened 25 years ago and I remember it very differently. That's the only missing time kind of aspect that I would put on something. Um, but there's, um, so what was it? What was the other thing you asked besides missing time? Just any other kind of elements that, that kind of, I guess, piqued your interest or made you wonder or allowed you to connect the dots, things like that. Well, there was, so after, so when I saw my one and only black triangle that I'm aware of, um, after that started a recurring semi-lucid dream. And why? Well, the reason I say semi-lucid is because each time I would go through the same um, operations or motions or actions, but I, I was like, oh, here I am again. Mm. And here we go again. And here it is. And it's a strange thing because this is one of those where I don't like it because there are there are cross references with the folks who are writing books about this secret space program. Um, I wake up in a, in what I would consider a first. I think it's a hotel room, and I'm on an orange bedspread. It's uh, felt, and I'm clothed. I'm wearing a, a battle dress uniform of some kind. I don't remember whether it was camouflage or colored or what. Um, on there's a bed next to me there's a woman on the bed with short blonde hair wearing a white tank top and and now that i'm saying it in public it's it's you know the story is burned i'll never be able to figure out who this person is but that's okay i don't really care if that if they're real or not um short blonde hair white tank top um boxer shorts that either have red hearts or red dots on them she's uh, asleep on her right side the first thought in my head is, "What? Well, oh my God, what have I done? I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's not my way. Um, but then in a moment, I realize there's something in me that says, that's not what's going on. You guys work together. I look at the back of the door because I think I'm in a hotel room and it does not have the checkout time information on the back of it. Like a, practically every hotel room I'm used to. It doesn't have a deadbolt. It's just a doorknob. I'm sitting up, I'm scanning to the left, there's a black dresser, there's no TV on the dresser, um, which is weird for a hotel room or a bedroom, you know what I mean, most folks have a TV yeah. in the room. Um, the dresser is all black, seamless, no handles, I know that if I push it, it just comes out. I turn, I put my feet on the ground, they're boots, I look up, um, there's a, I assume this is the bathroom in front of me now, I'm facing away from the door and the woman. And there's a there's a glass door in front of me. It's opaque. It has a long silver handle on the left side. And I assume it's the bathroom. So I'm going to go in there and gather my thoughts and figure out what the heck is going on. And it's weird to know I'm doing this again when it when it was the recurring dream. You know what I mean? And just yeah. to be in there and be like, all right, am I going to see anything different? Try to pick out different aspects. I put my hand on the silver handle and the whole door goes um, goes transparent. I open the door and I step out into a hangar bay. It's um, just like it would be on an aircraft carrier, a non-skid on the ground, a yellow safety line in front of me, and people moving all these olive drab cases around and other stuff. And, you know, it's a regular busy hangar bay, and that's where it, where it ends. And then I have a brief vision of being in like a, like a movie theater seat or a jump seat, and I'm all jocked up, as we would say, all my gear. And I'm surrounded by a lot of other people in gear. And um, I don't have corresponding military or combat-related memories of those things. Um, I'm not an expert on dreams and hallucinations, what we would call a hallucination, what we would call a recurring lucid dream. The coincidence of that starting right after that going over my head, feeling like that was what I was in and on and observing, I don't like it. Um, I'm not a believer in secret space program. I'm not a believer in the idea that we have five observable technology being utilized. 
in the by our government right now. I don't I don't I am not a personal believer in that. So what these experiences that these other folks are describing, I'm not having the same experience, but there are some data points that correspond. Um no, you go. It don't make any sense to me. It don't make any sense. Yeah. No, it's it is hard to make sense of it. So that those kind of experiences, dreams, whatever they may or may not be that that started after yeah directly after you saw that the black triangle fly over your your yard and yeah and i had and that was five months after the tic tac um yeah. incident and i don't i don't have any recollection of any kind of change that happened for me during in between tic tac and all that people always ask me did you experience xyz and i i just remember cool experience probably a ufo no one cared go back to work new father new chief overwhelmed with life you know what i mean like i just kept trucking mm. but that five months later giant black triangle going over all i hear is the wind going over its skin i don't understand it doesn't make any sense how frequent of the i don't know what to call them you know dreams experiences hallucination like you said earlier like what the terminology but but how frequent has that been uh how frequent was it do you still have that yeah going back through my life um it seemed relatively often it seemed like every couple of years i would have what i would what i think most of us would consider a sighting and then i would kind of brush it under my my carpet my mental carpet um i'm not a fan of folks who like have you know recovered memories i don't understand how that works it's always dubious so I try to stay consistent, but I, a couple of years back, I was asked to sit down and write down all the weird stuff that had happened to me in my life. And most of it I kept on this list because it all seemed like it was somehow phenomenologically related at some point. Um, there will be spurts, long spurts of synchronicities, and then they'll stop. Um, I had a really interesting time leading up to the Monroe Institute last year where I was in kind of a three-way conversation with um, some interesting folks, with Chris Bledsoe, Dr. David Broadswell, and John Alexander and I, Colonel John Alexander and I, were all kind of like in these two different conversations that were interacting with each other. David and I were speaking to each other, and he was speaking to Chris, and Chris had just spoken to John. And we had one of those group experiences where we're all in different places and we all stepped out and we all looked up at the sky and we all saw similar phenomena at the same time. Mm. Now, a lot of people have been through that. We'll call it a group experience, a synchronistic experience. It was, it was interesting. So I've, I've been through those. Uh, and I have also at times specifically tried to elicit a synchronistic response and almost been brought to my knees when it's occurred. Uh, and it, they're so strange. The, the couple that I would cite are so strange and fantastic that I don't want to put them out there because I just don't want to. I don't want to deal with the the nonsense and the, the people yeah, that are yeah. going to think that because I don't know what's going on. I'm not a I'm not a believer per se in really anything. I'm an observer and I have a memory. Yeah. Um. But it's. I don't have continuity that makes sense. No continuity that makes sense. No. Just hope one day it will make sense for you, man. Um, those those semi lucid dreams experiences again, however we want to call it, that that you kind of time wise the the started happening around the time you saw the black triangle. Has that specific? You said it was kind of recurring. So how many times has that happened? And and that that went on for about a year. Um, and then it stopped. And then it stopped. Never forgotten it. Um, was it like once a month kind of thing? Or was it like less often? Maybe once was a it week. a little sporadic? About okay. once a week, it seemed like it, it, it got, and then it, it, it tapered off. It wasn't once a week for a whole year. And you weren't seeing the triangle repeatedly. You just never saw, that saw that it. Was... Again. I've never seen one again. No. And what shocked me that night was I know exactly what a B2 looks like. Like, whatever, let me put it this way whatever the next iteration is that just came out, the. Hustler or whatever I can't even remember the whatever it's called. It look it's the same thing as as a B two. It's just more advanced. Like I would have known if this was this was not prosaic technology. It was huge and slow. 
So it was obviously utilizing some level of anti-gravity or, or, or mass display or mass displacement or something like that. Uh, but no, I'd never seen it again. Um, I had another thing that happened in, um, we'd had a challenge here at home. I was interrupted by a compellent, by being compelled to, this was the memory of being compelled to go upstairs and look out the window. It's the basis of one of my amateur little hobby songs called Goblin, Goblin Problems. But I saw something, I saw a saucer out the window, an entity on the right, and I freaked out and tried to go out the window after the entity and then woke up in my bed. And my recollection of the events the evening prior were different than my wife's recollection. And again, um, I don't know what to do with it. It's, it's, let me put it this way. We all, we all dream some often, some less, some more vividly than others, but we all understand what a normal dream feels like. And it doesn't matter how weird a dream is. That's a normal dream. We're not we're not surprised when we're building it as one of my favorite comedians says a, a go kart with our ex landlord. You know, there's we're not weirded out by it. It's when our dreams have a different flavor and have a different feel and touch and taste and texture where they feel like reality. Those are the ones that stick with us. So that's all I can really say about some of these periods in consciousness and these memories is that they are very poignant and they stuck with me. And I, and they're not something I necessarily wanted to have, you know? Yeah, definitely. I get that. And it's, yeah, it's not something that's easy to deal with and everything like that. And like you say, you're just trying to make sense of it. You're just a human trying to figure out what the, what the hell is going on and, and how does it fit in? And, and yeah, what's it all about? <laughs> and obviously I can't tell you what to do with it. It's, uh, wow. It's, uh, it's, it's hard. Um, I guess let me ask you about one more experience. Um, I won't ask you to recollect any others after that for today, um, but it would be the one. So last time we spoke, uh, you kindly passed a, a video to me that you took um, of a UAP. And uh, obviously you said we can put it on the screen. We put it on the screen and and it, it was fine. Nobody really noticed anything for a few weeks. Um, and it, it was just there. And then obviously a few other people noticed it and uh, and what the floodgates open and the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, yeah, the Internet did its thing and people were giving you shit. They, they were tearing you apart. They were coming up with their own narrative. You were all of a sudden, uh, you know, and in, you were grifting us for money or you were working for the government or whatever, you know, whatever storyline people wanted to come up with to, to, to give themselves a bit of fun that day. Mm -hmm. But anyway, to stop people guessing, yeah, I wanted us to be able to talk about it or you to be able to talk about what actually went down when you saw that, that, Again, UAP, we don't know exactly what it was. We're not saying uh, the the alien spacecraft when you saw whatever that white thing was that, that goes wow. along. Um, yeah, talk talk to me again about that that day, that that sighting, what happened, what went down, in, in however much detail you want to go into. So I think that um, a lot of folks are waiting for, uh, for a bombshell sighting or an earth-changing video. I've seen plenty of them. If you're there, some things are 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 are, are world changing for you. Um, we're all skeptics. I don't blame anyone who is skeptical of the video that was presented, but be skeptical of the claims being made by the people presenting the video. And I am making no claims with that video. So, the the uncomfortable doxing that went on aside. Um, let's talk about the folks that were ready to talk about how this was a hoax, how this was made up. Um, they're not going to believe the witnesses that were present, which were my wife, Lou's wife. And then later after, after the incident, um, my children and Lou, but the way it went down was like this. And we're not stating anything happened. I think Lou was downstairs in his office. Um, I was sitting on the floor with his German shepherds. I was meditating. And our uh, our wives were sitting off to the left chatting. And I'd been sitting there for about five minutes with my hands on the dog's chest going like this. And we were all just enjoying the, you know, the grooviness of it. And um, all of a sudden, I stood up and felt compelled to go to the window and begin filming that. 
Now, what folks see, I'm, I can't, I don't know if you included the sound in the background or not, but it's, um, it was me and me talking to my wife. And I think Lou's wife says a couple of things in the background, but me say, basically saying, it's probably a bush plane. Nah, maybe not. I don't want to say what I think it is because I never, almost never say UFO. I'll but, add something. I think you said like we'll we'll rewatch the video after and and we'll try and you know we'll look at it again and things yeah. like that. Nobody was making any claims and and everything like that. Um, and I'm yeah, not zooming on. in. I'm not. I have no idea what I'm looking at. I just know that man, that doesn't look right. And something just made me go and and walk to it. Now a lot of folks have experienced that feeling, that compelling feeling to get up, get off the couch, walk outside, and then they see a shooting star immediately. Or they see some a flash or something like that. A lot of people have reported that kind of thing. That's basically what happened for me. Is I just felt compelled. It looks weird. It's I was I've been trained in accident um, crash investigation in in you know motor vehicle and aircraft and aerospace. Um, when I say recovery, I mean a prosaic stuff we know about never been trained in recovery of ufos so people shouldn't jump to any conclusions of that recovery doesn't always mean what we want it to mean um but what i saw was was crazy i, I mean i i had no idea what i was looking at and so then when we got back to that we after it disappeared into the what it looked like it disappeared into the mountain and looking at the terrain afterward i don't know what what it was i mean if it was a giant white garbage bag full of helium floating along that's possible and maybe it's it just straight for that sure i'm, I'm just saying that like <laughs> in the realm of, I know, I know. perhaps not probable but yeah. let's give let's give the let's give the the debunkers just a simple thing and let's just say yeah. let's just say it was a small dirigible of some kind or a hobby balloon or who knows they would make okay fine it cra it just bleh, went into the side of the mountain um that's what it appeared from a mile away we went out to the site. We checked it out. That thing was short. It was slow. It was low. And neither of us knew anything that could do that. The sheriff knew nothing about it. Local air traffic control said there was nothing in the area for the last six months. You know, we made some calls, did our due diligence, but I don't know what people think is going to happen after that. We got what we got. A video we can't explain testimony that, that that went along with it it's an unknown the idea that folks are going to jump to conclusions that it's aliens that we made it up man it's folks should also realize that for some folks folks keep seeing the same stuff it's not that it's weird that it was there it's not weird that this it's what we have to start saying is is for some reason these things keep being noticed by people and often by the same people more than once. Yeah. The only thing missing for folks that across the board that want to debunk or just disregard this subject seems to be the experience itself. There are researchers who have never had an experience. They want to get to the bottom of it. They're researching it. They, 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 they really care. They know something's going on, but they don't know it's happened yet. And then you've got your folks that just, they've never seen anything. They don't believe it. They think it's all BS and they just totally discard it. And then you got the folks that are happening to, and that's a, a spectrum of people that, that all the way from, well, that's Jesus and he's my cousin and here's what he wants me to tell you all the way to, you know, they're the strangest aliens you've ever seen in your life. And we're in an Ascension pro I don't know. There's too many stories. There's too many narratives. Um, this was just an unidentified aerial phenomenon, or if people really want to hear it, it was an unidentified flying object that was recorded on an iPhone. And the only reason that it wasn't, um, also other, a lot of people approach me and they're like, well, who'd you send it to? Who did the forensic analysis? Man, this was the, an hour and a half before our flight home after Thanksgiving. I, I still got it. I shared it with folks. What do you think we're going to do with that? What do you think? I, I have a red phone to call the Pentagon and go, I have a, you know, a, a interesting thing to submit. It's just another one of a million videos of something people don't understand, but because of where I was and who I was with, people went off the deep end on it. And it's just a perfect example of why we can't have nice things. 
Mm-hmm. Nobody asked for a nickel. Nobody said it was anything. We're just like, hey, check this out. This was weird. Weird things happen. People see weird things. They record weird things. They record things that they can't explain that look really strange that we will never get to the bottom of. Yeah. You know, it, it, it is what it is. But it, But the folks like me who have video like that, have questions, I'm not trying to make myself out as this big, brave, courageous guy. But we have to continue to have the courage to present these things, not be afraid, not jump to conclusions, and not let the naysayers and the unimaginative people just try to pour water on on the fire. Um, We have to continue. We have to keep sharing. That whole situation sucked for me and Lou and for his family. People really, really showed how low down and dirty they can be. Um, but I, we just have to be better at protecting our folks. We can't stop trying to help people learn about this or understand it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was rough. Uh, I felt partly responsible, even though you gave your kind of blessing to put it up there. I felt, you know, like even again, you gave permission and everything, but I felt like it's still coming from, from, from my conversation with you. And I felt like, ah, oh, you know, like why, I blame why no one but myself. To... I, I should have yeah. known better. I should have considered that there are people out there, you know, waiting for details um, that they can cross-reference. It was unfortunate. Yeah, it, it just it it showed it showed the unfortunate underbelly of our of our community at large, mm. which is partisan based, which has people that are constantly in a war of rude and. Um, just childish memes against each other. And I don't care who you are. I, I don't care what you represent. It, stop being jerks to each other. And yeah. if the other guy is a total jerk, just turn his mic off. Stop listening to him. Stop paying the troll. Stop feeding the trolls, please. Mm. Do positive yeah. work. Yeah. Like, like we said earlier, like you said earlier, it's not too late to not be a dick. Um, so yeah, it, that was rough though online like what was it like to deal with that kind of barrage and and it wasn't just hate you know like people were like oh they're they're hoaxes uh it was there was also misinformation like i you know because i was spoken to you about it beforehand obviously before after our interview we we talked about what you've just said and, and obviously it's exactly the same as what you just said but i was reading these comments and i'm like I, I, obviously i knew what had actually happened when you saw it and everybody's m- making stuff up and it's like, you know, like whispers, like it's just the narrative is changing and all of a sudden people are commenting stuff that's just so far from the truth, so far from accurate. And yet they're saying it as if like, that's it. That's that's what happened. And then people were replying like, like, oh, really? I didn't know that. And, and it's like, whoa, I saw like firsthand how things can really take on a narrative of their own, but take on a life of their own, you know, like, uh-huh. like, like you put something out there and all of a sudden somebody adds one and one and they get four and then they like put out the rumor. Did you know that that's four? Like, and then everybody's talking about it and, and somebody here is 44 and, and it's just, it and now there's, a, now there's and, a whole timeline and fan fiction and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It was absolutely wild. Like, um, like everything people saying that you're, you're doing it to profit from it and you're doing it because it's a psyop and everything like yeah. this. And like I said to you before we started the interview, like where, where would the profit be anyway? It's nonsensical. Like we're going yeah, release, it on, show me. Please show release me. it on theories of everything or Lex Fridman or Joe Rogan. Like why are you releasing it on my show? I mean, you wouldn't be very good at your profit profit driven motive if that was the, uh, the idea. Let me put it, I mean, like folks are folks act like we presented that as if it were something like you know when you and i talked about i was like man this is nothing it's just another video of a blip against the mountains but But if you want to put it on you 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 can put it on and it's and you know it is what it is and yeah yeah, it's uh but like so they think that we're dumb enough to number one try to hoax people or number two that we're dumb enough that we get something like that and then we don't do anything with it what do you do with it Go on the internet and type UFO, UAP video. Look at 20,000 of them. Yeah, it's it's madness. I remember some of the comments people were saying, um, why would he tweet this out? Like, he just tweeted it out the other day. Why did he do that? And it's like, he didn't. 
he he gave permission to a podcast to put it on the screen during their conversation in the background. And when he tweeted about the podcast interview, he didn't say go and check out this snippet of a UFO video I film. It Somebody took created, about... a, created a Reddit post. Yeah, and it took what three or four weeks until that happened, or something along those lines. And they then created just... a straw man around what we had mm. done and just presented mm. it as fact. Yeah, it, it it's nuts. It, it's yeah. Yeah, it was wild, but I appreciate you kind of setting the record straight and and talking about mm -hmm. it, and and obviously we want to think about how it's gonna you know affect people that have a video or that have seen something. Like we we want to make sure, like you said earlier, that people feel liberated and able to come forward and and share what they've seen or what they are you know their video or just their 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 their, their, their statement. I have um, a video right now on my computer from Las Vegas two weeks ago. The person is a friend of the family who was on vacation and they requested to remain anonymous and I'm not going to make the same dang mistakes I did before. Um, I'm not sure what I want to do with this. I'm going to send it to a few friends who, who we may end up just saying, as we often do, man, that looks legit. But at the end of the day, there's a million other videos like this out there hitting the internet every day because this stuff is happening. But these were three. Let me just put it this way. Uh, I was over the MGM Grand, so it could be anything. OK, this is in Las Vegas. This could be a lot of different things. Could have been balloons, could have been drones, could have been all kinds of stuff. Darn it, if they didn't look. Here's the thing. It was around noon. OK, so why were they luminous from the bottom they were very they're very luminous there's three of them one of them is moving around they, again could be drones but from what i know about albedo reflection all these other things i can't for the life of me figure out what kind of drones these are that they're so stinking bright they're messing with the with the camera's um ability to mm -hmm. to determine what they look like it's really interesting for lack of a better word, they're either three orbs or tic tacs or lenticular shapes or something above the Las Vegas Strip. It's about a minute and a half, two minutes long. I'm not sure what people would like for me to do with this. People who want to want to be entertained would want to immediately see it. People who disbelieve this stuff would immediately say just what they said with the last one. Why does Cahill have these? Well, because somebody sent it to me, man. Um, but the other thing is that we're never going to know exactly what they are. No. Even if I had some magic button that I could press that gave me the air traffic control data, the local radar data, all of the um, all of the cameras from all of the surrounding hotels. Like, first of all, I don't have the resources to get any of that stuff. I don't have the authority to request it. Some of those things take subpoenas. Some of those things, you know, I don't think folks understand. I wonder what people would want me to do with that friend of the family's video that may or may not be UAP. Would it have any value coming from me? If not, does it have any value just being put on the internet for everyone else to see or find from an anonymous you know, standpoint or something like that? It's not compelling enough for me to call Jeremy Corbell and give it to him and say, Jeremy, you've got to put this in your next movie. Should it be in one of... It's like, how many montages of UFOs do we have to see? yeah yeah and then someone in it always sticks some cgi nonsense in the middle or you know one of the local experts will be like well those three were proven wrong and it's like you can almost never present anything without a huge preamble and a long conversation afterward you know what i mean uh, i've watched mm -hmm. friends with podcasts like this that put up montages of internet-based stuff because you know, you hear the drums, you do the montage, and then you're like, all right, welcome back to Bob's podcast. But people rip them apart. They're like, what are you putting all these fake UFOs and aliens and stuff on your show? It's like, man, that's an intro to a show. Just relax. You know, it, I don't know. I, it, it's frustrating. Yeah. I know people don't like it when I get frustrated, but... But it is frustrating. And there's no, there probably is no right answer. There's no, There's no, you know, win-win for for what you do with that like like you say if you if we put it on the screen here that's my vote by the way let's put it on the screen yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah if you you tweet it out you put it up on a podcast you do whatever some people are gonna yeah why yeah exactly what you said why is cahill got all this why is it why is it always him or did, did lou send him that like uh, you know right. be, everybody will be coming up with everything 
But then, yeah, if you hold on to it now after mentioning it, they're going to be like, oh, so he has a video that he's not going to share with us and all that kind of thing. Um, I guess if I was to try and actually answer your question rather than just, you know, kind of assessing how everybody else would react, maybe the best is is if if the people that send it to you are happy for you to put it out there, you, you do put it out, but with, yeah, a very definitive, like, disclaimer, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then what are they going to say, you know, like... Pff- if but it's should, almost like you would have get to get a lawyer to write the disclaimer. You got to watermark the disclaimer across the whole screen <laughs> <laughs> or else they're going to find the five second spot or crop it out. And, you know, yeah. no, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I'm not going to stop. No. I mean, it, it's. I don't know. I'm not worried about the trolls anymore. I'm really what not. What would you say to somebody that, that does have a video that they're not sure what it is, they're not convinced it's anything, but but they think it's interesting, um, and obviously they have then seen everything go down with, with you in the video recently, and they, they don't want to get on the wrong side of, like, as you put it, the trolls and, and the haters and, and the negative kind of, you know, like t- tsunami. Right. What would you say to somebody like that? And and how did it affect you as well? Because obviously some people will just see this this big, tough gruff guy but you're a human that has feelings and and you have a family and and you know how did did it did it impact you at all it did um i was angry i was sad i was hurt i was all those things um I don't, i'm not crying anything let me just put it this way i have no. i have put my due diligence and effort into the into this mission um i'm proud of what we accomplished um now is the time when i have to look to looking out for my family and take care of them uh that may mean more time away from ufos and i'm not really worried about it because it's it's whatever it is it's going to be what it is it doesn't rest on any one person's shoulders um but it really gave me a lot of food for thought how far what am i willing to risk what am i willing to give up how far am i willing to go how much do i care what other people say or think about me it's a slippery slope. Mm. Um, I don't surround myself. I don't have a cadre of yes men around me. Um, I'm very skeptical of what we're working on. My family is, is you know, they're on crazy watch all the time to make sure dad's, you know, walking the right path. I don't blame them. That's the right thing for them to do. Yeah. Um, but the level of resistance that is out there to even having this discussion still is so high and it gets so personal for some people that i i am interested sometimes in just walking away from all of this um that i'm only for the fact that i don't like one point sources nobody is i don't like i don't like messiahs i don't like people who say you have to listen to me um you know what I mean? I, I don't like that kind of level of control, not in a world full of 8 billion people. So I keep telling myself, this is going to be fine without me. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I don't have to experience the stress, the worry. I don't have to accept uh, any more anger or hate from people who don't know me. At the same point, there is a feeling of that being the mission. Like you've got to do all the other stuff. You got to take care of your family. You got to be good. But if you if you've seen, touched, tasted this phenomenon, you have a obligation to your fellow man to discuss it. Mm. It's hard to put down. Yeah, yeah, I bet. But I, I guess if you ever had to, if you ever felt like uh, that it was it was time, you know, like you couldn't give any more, your you, your juice was squeezed. I don't think anybody would blame you, or the I, trolls might, and people like that. But you know. Most people wouldn't, because again, you're a human, just like uh, the rest. I'm of not. Us. I'm not worried about it. It's a personal struggle. It doesn't make me better or worse than anybody. I'm not looking for sympathy or or anything like that. But um, it's not an easy decision to make. Yeah. Um, and again, if anybody has a video, try not to. Yeah, let the the reaction, the negative reaction to Sean's video. Put, you put, asked me put what you should off. people do. Mm. If they were to get wanted to get ahead of what I went through they would find a video forensics expert first to verify the metadata for them to verify the uh, all the other you know embedded data within there and then if need be sign an nda to not dox anybody remove the data but you know be willing to state that they have it and you know 
the the level of safeguarding you have to go through to mm -hmm. to try to satisfy scientists skeptics debunkers you know there's a lot to it do we have any videos we call a definitive ufo video no why are you getting mad at anybody i mean if it's obviously not cgi it's an unknown man it's it just it's crazy the way people get angry about this stuff i it, mean it, they're obviously getting angry because you said these are aliens you know you said point blank you know but <laughs> i'm obviously joking right yeah you you very much did not say anything i'd make sure i'm shaking my head because yeah. somebody will clip that out and be like, <laughs> yeah yeah that's the yeah as i'm saying it i'm like oh are they gonna actually believe me here no that was that was definitely a joke um no it was uh that was wild but i'm glad hopefully like here cleared a bit of the air for because i'm guessing a large group of the people that did give that kind of hate and vitriol and everything and jumped on the bandwagon here I'm guessing a big proportion of that group are just people that are not really sure and they kind of were easily swayed and led and, and maybe when they hear this, they'll be like, oh, okay, I mean, maybe I jumped to conclusions. Obviously, there's going to be a, a proportion of them that are going to hear this, going to be like, ah, yeah, sure. Go. So you, you know, it's going to change nothing I think we've got that a lot people, of people but... like to stir the pot. Mm, they love it. Some people. <laughs> a lot of people like being negative and they get a rise out of it. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't even know when the last time I commented on a video or a Reddit post was, but there's people that spend all day commenting. Yeah, There's people in our community that seem to hold down full-time jobs but tweet up 200 times a day. Um, I don't live in that space anymore. I don't know that I ever did. Um, I try to utilize social media as the tools that they are. Um, I can't satisfy those folks that are on the drip that, you know, if you're living in the realm of UAP and UFO to be entertained, you're probably going to think everything is entertainment and everyone is an entertainer. Mm. Um, if you're within this community as a researcher, as a person who wants answers, regardless of whether you're a experiencer or not, then will that requires a certain level of dedication and, um, and discipline. Mm. Um, we have to remember a lot of those folks are just getting a rise. They're just having fun. They don't care. A lot of people are just here for the good time, not for yeah. a long time and not for each other. Yeah. So, and they're allowed to be here for themselves. That's the crazy part. Yeah. Still kind of blows my mind that some people get their kicks out of being mean to other people, but Hey, that's, that, that happens. Um, Okay, Sean, so thank you again for your time today. Uh, really, really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun again. Um, but yeah, so to finish us up, have you got any kind of last words, words of wisdom? Uh, it doesn't have to be wise at all, but just anything you want to say to people that have been watching or listening. I know that this uh, this is a confusing topic, um, and the topic itself is, is not always easy to define. Um, I think if, if people maintain their open-minded aspect and remember that we all have individual reasons for being here, um, we should examine those reasons. Reasons. We should ask ourselves, why are we here and what do we want out of, out of the phenomenon? Um, I think a lot of people dig a lot farther into it than they probably need to, but a lot of the answers that they're looking for have actually presented themselves to them. And they just need the courage of conviction to put their life on the right course um, to understand those things. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, a lot of times the hardest thing that we can ever do is initiate change in our own life. We wait for other people to push us forward or to give us permission. So I guess for the folks in the audience that are waiting for permission to make those changes, here it is. You have that permission. Awesome. Thank you again, Sean. And, and I'm looking forward to next time, round three, where we're going to do, yeah, like a kind of the quick fire questions of all the ones that I've left on the table over the first and second interview, seeing as I, I plan these questions and we just manage to talk. Like, I just like talking to you and and, and, and we just get carried away sometimes. So yeah, there's, there's loads left and, and we'll get to them soon and I'm looking forward to it. And, and I appreciate your time and, and willingness to share, man. I really do. Like, I, I think I might have said this to you last time, but the more people talk about these things and, and open up about these things, the more it liberates other people to do the same. And obviously that 
that's going to be the circle that is going to keep going and it's going to keep building and, and it's the way forward i think the way out of this and, and the way to un more understanding so i really appreciate it thank you so much quite mutual thank you man thank you to sean cahill for the conversation and thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did please see description for relevant links and other info if you're interested in unraveling the mysteries of the universe with us then please subscribe and if you want to help us keep making content please consider a small monthly donation via patreon thank you